So, for our next presentation, we have once again something completely different. <laughs> we have often uh, link uh, uh, pronouns to, well, pronouns themselves, books, films, but theater is something that's slightly less common. <laughs> so, I'll leave uh, uh, Christian Schreger and Alina Morgan to a uh, performative embodiment of pronouns. Cool. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, yeah. So we're we're theater people, um, and actually we're going to start with who we are and also who we are not. So I'm Kristen. I'm a PhD student in theater at UC San Diego, um, and I mentioned here that I am I am a language enthusiast. Um, I am not a linguist by trade. I have not studied linguistics. That is not. The, the theoretical end of things is not my area at all. Um, but I offer that at, at least to provide some explanation for when this project came up, why I agreed to do it, instead of just saying no. Uh, and I'm Alan with the Y. Um, and I'm an MFA acting student at UCSD, uh, San Diego. I love long walks on the beach. And I'm a sandwich enthusiast, which as of last week, I got a job making sandwiches to turn your passions into uh, <laughs> um, and uh, also not a linguist, though I can speak Spanish. I am not a Spanish person. Oh, cool. Uh, there we go. So right. Um, so the language that I developed is called Brodash, um, and it was developed for a production last winter at UC San Diego, which is a stage adaptation of Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew, called Taming of the Shrewd. <laughs> um, and basically, uh, <laughs> the goal uh, essentially was, um, so the idea for the production came out of a concern from some of the women in our MFA program that they wanted more substantive roles for women. Because if you look at the theatrical canon, it's heavily weighted towards men, and so they wanted some additional opportunities. And one of our directors said, great, let's do some shaker, we'll do an all-women Taming of the Shrew, we'll call it Taming of the Shrewd. Um, and her concept for that was to actually set it in a post-apocalyptic future where you have a band of women warrior actors that are putting on Taming of the Shrew as a cautionary tale to remember sort of how things were back when the patriarchy was running things, uh, essentially. And so in the course of doing this, um, right, and of course Taming of the Shrew in and of itself kind of examines ideas about gender, it examines ideas about power, uh, it looks at how control manifests. So it was uh, a pretty pointed choice in terms of which play we were going to look at. In the course of development, one of the things that happened is that it turned out that there were three MFA men that needed a home. So we said, great, we'll take the men too. <laughs> so we had all the women and then we had the men. And the point was that the women were going to have kind of the substantive roles, including the male roles in Taming of the Shrew, which meant what are we going to do with the new men? Um, and conveniently, we already had this idea of a post-apocalyptic future. So we said, great, there'll be a band of raiders. They're going to show up in the middle of Act 1. They're going to attack, you know, they'll attack the women. Um, the women will take them prisoner, and then we'll figure the rest out later. Um, and that's basically what we did. Yep. Yeah. So, um, so we have these, this group of women. Um, here you see one of them standing on top of their kind of base of operations. And they are attacked by these guys. Who we call the others. Uh, so this is Max, Hunter, and Alan. There we go. Um, yeah, and so the way that it kind of started in the, the early production process is that, oh, right, and I should mention, like, what was I doing on this? Um, so I was the dramaturg for the production. I don't know how many of you are familiar with dramaturgy at all. Yeah, that's pretty normal. Um, so in, in short, um, dramaturgy can take a lot of different roles depending on the needs of a particular production. So for this one, part of what I was responsible for was providing um, assistance to the actors in terms of the Shakespearean text to make sure they understood what Shakespeare was saying, since that can get a little dicey. Um, and then providing sort of context information. So we knew we were working in a post-apocalyptic future, so then it was sort of like, okay, so what are the 
what are typical concerns? Part of my role was to ask questions about the world for the director to think about. So what kind of apocalypse do we have? Are we talking zombies? Are we talking alien? Climate change? Like, where are we here? Um, and so when we settled on a kind of climate change related disaster to avoid the need for zombies making appearance at some point in the show. Um, so we let that go. Yeah. Um, and so that was part of it. And because this production required the construction of a frame, my job was to write the frame. So all of the text that surrounded the Shakespeare, I wrote. Uh, what that meant and why it's significant here is that when we had these guys, I was constructing them from scratch. The, the band of raiders that interferes with the Shakespeare doesn't exist in the Shakespeare. Um, so they didn't exist prior to the, the construction of the frame. Um, and so, yeah, here's another view of them after they've been captured by our fierce band of warrior women, and they get chained to a ladder for a while. They look very relaxed for being captured. They were very sassy at that point, but also tired. <laughs> and we were watching the show as it was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically so the women kind of said, like, okay, we will deal with you later, we will chain you to a ladder, back to the Shakespeare. Um, and that's exactly what they did. And so but part of what would happen is that as they're watching the show, you get these interactions where they, they keep sort of arriving and interrupting the Shakespeare as we go, until eventually they end up casting the Shakespeare in sort of the, some of the subordinate roles. So you'll see some of those images later. Um, okay, so the language itself. I met with the director. Uh, relatively early on, and we were talking about kind of the frame and what she wanted, and one of the things she said was like, hey, you know that old trope where men and women are so different that they practically speak a different language? I was like, yeah. She said, can we do that? I said, uh, yeah, if, if you want. She's like, yeah, but, but not like French. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, and she's like, it's got to be like, like, like fierce, masculine. I was like, I'm not sure how the French men would feel about that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean? Uh, what, and, <laughs> um, and she said, no, like, like, like Klingon. And I was like, ah, so you want a constructed language? She said, yeah. I said, okay. She said, can you do that? I was like, I guess. Let's go. <laughs> um, so I went out and I did a bunch of research and started to to compile this thing and to put it together. And so thinking about what the piece was actually going to need, we knew that it had already been cast. We knew that I had three actors that I had to work with. Um, one of the things that I realized kind of after the fact that would have been really useful to think of beforehand was that I built in a number of sounds that I just liked. And since I was building it, I could do what I wanted, so I put them in. Um, but that included a rolled R. It had occurred to me too late that I didn't know that all three actors could roll their R's. <laughs> So as sort of a caution, should you find yourself in this situation, you may want to check with the actors to see what sounds they can and cannot produce <laughs> functionally. Or alternately, if you're casting later, that's great. You can pick people that can do the thing that you need them to do. Um, and then the other thing is that the director, as I said, had this really particular idea of what she wanted, that the language had to sound masculine. Which, and I feel like there could be hours spent on just kind of trying to deconstruct what that's about, and like what how that works, and all of the kind of subtext, if you will, that is tied into the idea of like that a, that a language can sound feminine or sound masculine. Like that's a gender studies paper that is waiting to be written, I think. But um, but yeah, so she wanted kind of a particular sort of sound palette and I had to figure out what that was. Um, and the other thing is that so we kind of inherited these men after the fact, which meant that they weren't going to be showcasing their skills in terms of the Shakespearean text. So part of what I needed to do was to produce enough text to let them do their work. They needed to be able to do their jobs as actors. So they couldn't, um, at the risk of sort of minimizing what we do, they couldn't just sort of like run on with maces and like grunt and hit the women and run away. They needed to actually have things to say. They needed to be able to actually build characters and do the work of actors. So that was kind of where we were. Um, Initially, the director had asked for something that bore some resemblance to English with the idea that the audience might be able to pick up some of it. So I tried to do that at first. Um, it rapidly became clear that I totally, utterly failed at doing that. If you look at it in print, you can see some vague resemblances in some places, but I changed the grammar too much. 
um, as it turns out. And I used a bunch of sounds that don't really happen in English. So I kind of just ignored what she asked for and did what I wanted. <laughs> um, as, as one does sometimes. Um, so there was that. The second thing is that the from a development perspective, I knew that they were going to be invading. So I knew, because we'd already decided that we wanted to be quite sequenced when they arrived. And so the first time I knew that the first time we'd see them was going to be in the context of an attack. So the question in terms of, of language that I needed right away, because I needed to kind of get this moving very quickly, was... When you're, when you're invading a band, what, yeah, exactly, like some kind of battle cry, is it instructions? And so actually what I started with was like, you get them, you go over here, kind of stuff. And so then um, moving on from there, it, it gradually kind of built to, okay, so what happens after you've been captured and so on. So there was, we started with a, a relatively small amount of text that went to the actors of the camera. Um, that text alone gave us some grammatical features that gave us a little bit of insight into who these people might be. So right away there was a reciprocity that was starting to happen between the characters that they were building and the language itself. Um, and then just kind of very quickly, the last thing that I tried to think about in terms of this instruction that I needed to construct something masculine was that I tried to work within the idea that these were aggressors. So they're working in sort of a fairly flat, traditional concept of what masculinity looks like. Um, and so thinking about facial expressions, what some of some terms are wrong here, um, I tried to look at sounds that would produce the facial expressions that go along with particular emotional states to give them something to work with. So I tried to add in sounds that would encourage kind of growly faces that would give you some anger, some contempt, some disgust, the kind of stuff that they're really working with. Fantastic. So, um, start off, how do you create a character, embody a character, and then act uh, in a scene um, as this character when you don't understand the language, when there's no, uh, you can't think, you can't um, really improvise if a line falls, you can't pick it back up, uh, like we do in English, especially if you understand the character, you can kind of improvise your way through a scene if you go blank. Um, which is what we're training for, so to not do that. Um, and so we do the, I, you know, you have to go back and do the exact thing you would do with a normal, you know, an average character from uh, an English play that we understand, uh, which is who am I, where am I, and what do I want? So the basics, and the best thing about, the best thing you can do as an actor is to get specific. So though we didn't have anything uh, really to go on except for this constructive language, uh, we came together, the three actors, and Kristen, and we kind of decided, okay, what is our background? What is our name? How old are we? Where's our origin? You know, within this post-apocalyptic world, how are we different from the female tribe? How do we, how are we similar? Um, uh, and that also informs um, what we do physically. Uh, and so we decided to pair, not decided, it kind of happened, that the language and the circumstances uh, helped give us the physical life of these characters. When we all kind of came back together after a couple of days of rehearsal and independently, uh, we realized that a lot of the physical act, what we were doing with our bodies, is similar. Uh, the way that we presented ourselves, um, some would call it, you know, like peacocking. Um, whether or not our chest was out and whether or not we were flexing muscle, um, we, if we were passive, and within our, uh, the three of us, the hierarchy, who's in command, uh, who's older, uh, who's more passive character. Um, so yeah, so first we, we went ahead and got specific, and then, uh, we'll go to the next one. Um, embodied the character here, we kind of go with circumstances. So now within the scene, now that we've been captured, once we've defined everything as, as to who we are, so my character uh, being the tallest and the widest in the group became more of the, the aggressor and more of the muscle in the group. Um, and so automatically, like, even as I'm talking now, it kind of drops your voice a little bit. You're resonating uh, resonators from the chest and uh, from the diaphragm. Uh, they start to <coughs> really inform this low pitch yet pretty far throat voice, if you would. Um, and so what they started to do to us is once we got captured, they started to use uh, the weaker will, if you would, uh, to become part of the show. And so at the end, I was the last one left, so I refused to do it, being more proud. 
Um, and then obviously he who was first wears the skirt. Um, and he was, uh, and, and that question comes up when we're doing the design, uh, with costume design. It, would your character be comfortable wearing this? You separate yourself from the actor, from, as the actor, and you, you decide, okay, yes, the actor, we're comfortable wearing whatever it is, if anything. Um, and it uh, depends. Um, and so that's not the factor. The factor is what would the character be comfortable wearing? Um, so my character would never wear a skirt. Um, and so in the, next, in the slide before, you saw that he had like uh, a sweater that they tried to kind of, uh, you know, they put a little flower, a little uh, embroidery, a little, you know, just to give it some kind, just to like demean us in a little bit, especially with this character and the way that he presented himself. Um, and the language, what do you say about others when you're talking in the group, when you're talking to the women, how does that inform you physically? And then are you in control or submissive? Who has the power in the scene? Um, and then, if you go to the next slide, then comes in the language, this constructive language that now helps complete the character in that, okay, physically, this is where I stand, this is where the circumstances and, and this tribe and this post apocalyptic and us taking over this, uh, this, this, this group of women, uh, how does that, you know? How does that affect me? How savage do I become? Uh, and now does that does the language complement that, or does it fight it? And Kristen did a wonderful job of creating a language that's very aggressive, very animalistic, um, and so that helped us get more uh, carnal, if you would, uh, bloodthirsty, and that kind of helped inform this. As you see, uh, we all kind of came with this this animalistic uh, approach to the characters. Um, where we were growling a lot, where we were showing our teeth, peacocking, um, a lot of, uh, and, and also like, where where is the language made? Like, where does the sound come from? Is, is it guttural? Do is it in the back of the throat? Are we throwing it forward? Uh, like uh, English speakers, uh, are, are we like monotone, like American English speakers, uh, or do, is it? Yeah, does it have a melody to it? And that also helps inform how these characters come to life. It, the moment that you try to fight that um, <coughs> with a melodic uh, character that has a high pitch and you try to be this animalistic, there's very obvious um, friction between the two. It doesn't complement itself uh, the way that it would uh, when you pair them two. It, it, it's, you can't help it. And even as I'm explaining it, I feel like I'm kind of like kind of hunching yeah. over and getting into it. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of the little basics of how we approach the character not knowing the language uh, or thinking the language, more feeling uh, came more from what what that did was internally and then expressed it externally. Yeah, and so there are a couple of things that, that happened. So they had the, that initial block of text. Um, like I mentioned, one of the things that we found was that in terms of how verb tenses work, kind of jointly discovered that there wasn't a conditional tense. And part of that was that it just, in the course of what they were saying, they didn't really need it, but it offered some interesting implications of, okay, so what kind of people don't have a conditional tense? What does that mean? Like, what may that indicate for them culturally? Uh, what kind of people are these? In addition, because the text was still being created, so we, you know, we had that initial fight sequence, and then we were sort of figuring out the rest as we went along, there was this opportunity so that the actors would kind of come forward and say, hey, um, can we, we need a battle cry. Can we have a battle cry? And I was like, sure, let me, I'll give you a battle cry. So I gave them a battle cry. And they came up and they're like, we need some obscenities. And I was like, <laughs> of course you do. So I gave them some of those. Um, they came up at one point and when they're chained to that ladder, the women are sort of doing their thing. They're like, we need cat calls. And I was like, great, and we'll go make up some cat calls. So I came back and gave them some cat calls. Um, and then there are all these different scene interruptions, and those scenes continue to go back and forth with who these people were. So one example of one of the interruptions, and this one tracks pretty closely to the English, um, is this moment where Max, who's the guy that you saw in the skirt a few slides ago, um, is apparently a theater enthusiast that we discovered along the way, and he recognizes the play when Petruchio gets to the Kiss Me Kate line. Um, but sort of going through that scene, he's kind of figuring out what's going on, and finally he jumps up and announces that he's recognized the play. And the guy next to him is like, oh, it's Taming of the Shrew? And he's like, yeah. And this last moment where Max breaks into English to explain to the women what they're yelling about is the only time that they speak English outside of the Shakespearean text. 
So that was actually also really important for us to find some way to explain how they could read the Shakespearean text at all. Um, and so the last thing that we have for you, like, is a brief scene, which I wrote specifically for this purpose, um, which is just to give you an opportunity to kind of hear the language and sort of see physically what that looks like. Um, we, we, we do have some text with us just for, you know, anxiety. Um, because I'm a PhD student, not an actor. Um, and so, yeah, so here we go. And so the, to set the scene for this particular one, uh, this is one of the boys has made his way home to his uh, superior at home, if you will, and is reporting back on what has just happened. Sucking face. Por ihe na brodinfoi. Trita ihe selafai. Por trete ihe. Then the machine of people. Huh. You want them erish kinder pull to rush while in him to put the leo. Some tea. Pascal. Father Oscar. Erish what? No, no. Do it. Tommy for the shrug. Tommy for the shrug. In a denominator, which was an action. One action was done on them. Done on skin. Fish an option? We're far in the They were taking a mesh. But on it, Ellen Abra Dunford. When in the rock, they were targets. And see. <laughs> yes. So I had a question regarding and uh at first point the hunter sort of enters mm -hmm. and they get the plot and they become more better. So my question is or like in some cases, yeah. yeah. There's an attack. In a case, yeah. Um, so my question is, um, really there's a, a bit of a fireworks system going oh, yeah. on here, of like the men who do this way and the women who, um, I'm assuming they keep the same kind of eyes that they want to keep them to preserve the So I guess my question is, when this, um, So the question is, once the men kind of entered into the Shakespearean world and had more access to a, a feminine world, to what extent did that influence the language? Um, and for them, really, more than anything, what would happen is that you would hear from, so basically we had, we had three kind of uh, character types that we were working with to some extent, not to limit you to a type. That's okay. Um, but the, yeah, so we had one guy who, um, the guy that you see in the skirt, who's kind of a performance enthusiast, he's a little more um, willing to interact with a world that is a bit more gender fluid, you could say. Um, and he's basically, he's willing to take any opportunity to get out there on stage. That's his whole thing. So if you're familiar with Taming of the Shrew, he makes an appearance as the haberdasher, as like the hat seller that comes and Petruchio eventually like gets in the backside and sends out. Um, and then he reappears as the widow. So it's he's actually playing a woman there uh, when he has his skirt on. And it's it's very much about him getting to, to play anywhere. So increasingly what you hear from him is that he just uses the Shakespeare most of the time or he switches to English. So when we hear the women speaking, they're speaking to each other in English all the time. There's actually one sequence, um, which is the one Alan mentioned, um, and the one that you saw where there's a pink dress on the floor. So that's the same scene with the haberdasher, and Alan comes in as the tailor, but Alan's resistant to the entire process and doesn't want any part of this performing, doesn't want any part of this nonsense. Um, 
Max, who's the widow, has already been ejected as the haberdasher. Alan's refusing to play the tailor, and so one of the women turns around and is like, will someone come please play this tailor? Like, we need to move the scene along. And here comes Max running in with like, I would play the tailor! Um, and he just comes barreling in, but at that point he switched to English. So it does carry all the way through. So when they're, and actually at that moment, there's immediately a fight between Alan, who's like, I can't believe you're doing this, this is ridiculous. And Max, who sort of kind of comes back at him and, and reverts, if you will, to a more kind of aggressive state. So he goes back into the language for then, uh, actually, Alan takes over and, and he does play the tailor. Spoiler. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. More questions? Yes. Um, so I write plays, too, and I've been trying to ponder how <coughs> to work in a con line. Sure. Um, now, with TV being very, becoming more conlang oriented. Um, I, I imagine it's more acceptable in the theater, but you know, I, I've always been kind of a little hesitant because of the, you know, the there isn't enough motivatedness. There's there's too much arbitrariness that you know um, audiences might just like zone out at that point. I mean, with with a very um, emotion based language, it's kind of hard to zone out, but. It, to get into anything that isn't quite so visceral. Um, so my question is, how did the audiences react to it? How did they take it? They, do you wanna? Sure, so I think what, what happened was that Shakespeare itself can have that effect where uh, <laughs> people can kind of glaze over. Um, and so what we do is, the, the approach we take is, we kind of have this idea that we're training our audience because they're there, they're, they're, they're in front of us and we're in front of them. We get the opportunity to train them, if you would, to kind of tune their ear to what it is that we're saying, especially if you're using accent, if you're using Shakespeare. So to help them catch on to what's going on. So when we introduced this language, we took it, um, we did small, short lines, short lines, to try to train the audience to introduce that this isn't English or this is an unrecognizable language, this is something different. Um, and then from there, we were able to add more and more text to the point where we had a full monologue with our um, the center character here. Um, and the audience, what they did was they they enjoyed it because they started to understand Shakespeare because they couldn't understand our language. It kind of it, it forced them to grab onto what they would normally glaze over because their ear at this point was so tuned to to trying to pick up something that they can understand. Um, so Shakespeare lends itself really well to me to to this opportunity. Yeah. And I think part of it is offering opportunities for for interaction with it. So there was um, with one of the actors I wanted to give him. He was a third year, so he was at the end of his program, and I wanted to give him a nice big block of speech because I felt like there was just something virtuosic in doing like a speech in a, a language he didn't know. Um, and so that's what we did, and there was a sort of, the director was like, this is too much, people are going to get bored, and I was like, just, just wait for it, just wait. <laughs> and so he, he, he kind of goes and he's talking and he's talking and he's talking about like, we're going to capture you, we're going to do all this stuff, it's going to be horrible, and you know, we're going to take you to your slaves, blah, 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 blah. And then he stops and there's this breath, and the women all just kind of looked at each other, and then looked at him and went like, right, so anyway, we're just going to on with what we're doing. But it, and so it, it provided this sort of opportunity for people to sort of sit with this moment of like, do you know what he's saying? <laughs> no? Oh, none of us know what's going on. Right, okay, we're all on the same page here. Um, so a lot of it, exactly, I think is how you deploy it, and also how you respond to it in the world. So if it's a piece where everything is in a constructive language, then you may want to think about how, how you're going to make it legible, um, right. which is true with, with any medium that, that is departing from kind of the standard language. It's true with dance. It's true with, uh, with anything that's a little bit more eclectic, for sure. But it's, it's doable. I mean, I think you can set it up in a way that would be, would be OK. Uh, yes? I have a question from IRC that I should be probably taking right now. Um, is there a consideration of how much complex materials to write in, given that you won't have subtitles or convenient translation? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think we were pretty strategic. Also, Shakespeare is long, um, so there was overall length, so there was a limit to how much we wanted in terms of um, of making you know overly length with my language as much as I could. Um, so that was definitely happening. At, at the same time, there theoretically, in our case, we were working the round, so some kind of super title wouldn't 
wouldn't have been an option, but depending on the theatrical production, if you need subtitles, it would not subtitles. If you need super titles, some kind of something to make it legible, you can do that. There are ways. I think it's also the circumstance. I think it's the situation, and I think a lot of that can communicate physically as well. So it's up to the act give uh, off the physical as well as uh, the scripture. We are, we are being told. What's the production for Bravo? Oh. Thank you.